Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another reaction and review. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are checking out a movie from 1969. That movie is 2001 A Space Odyssey. We're sort of like kicking off sort of like a kind of like a month de dedicated to the works of Stanley Kubrick. And in that tradition, we are just going to basically just as as it says on the tin we're going to watch Stanley Kubrick from because the only other Stanley Kubrick movie I have actually seen is a clockwork orange and it's not it's a good movie don't get me wrong but it's not there are problems I do have with the movie compared to the book however there were a lot of other things I've always wanted to be able to check out the shining for example is something I've never seen but I've heard nothing but absolute praise for its direction Eyes Wide Shut, his last movie, is something I've also wanted to uh, <laughs> set my heart on seeing. There's also... Oh, God, there was a very specific one as well. It's sort of like... Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, Full Metal Jacket, uh, The Shining, and Eyes Wide Shut. So I think we could fit those four movies into this month of February. And I don't technically know really what to think about 2001 because... I've not seen it myself, hence why we're doing this. And finally, I heard that apparently on when the, the, this movie first came out, it received a lot of criticism, bad uh, criticism, I should say. And I never thought I think it could work out why. So we're about to see whether or not they really were right or wrong all this time. So with all that being said and done, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to kick back, relax, and check out 2001 A Space Odyssey. Ladies and gentlemen, was 2001 A Space Odyssey. Let me just uh, turn that off there. There we go, ladies and gentlemen, and... It's... I didn't, I didn't even know how long this movie was going to be before I even began, and it's nearly two and a half hours long, and... I was okay a lot a large portion of this film like I'd say nearly 75% of this film are these beautifully long shots of space and occasionally people moving quite slow and things like you know these strange and wonderful looking uh, pieces of uh, of space equipment, uh, rockets uh, flying or floating onto bases, and they were take they were really, really, really crazy shots. With when we saw Dave running on the walls, and this one shot of this like this air hostess just who uses these sort of slippers, and and she just does a complete three sixty on this on this uh, tunnel like corridor just to move away to uh, basically the, ca the cabin's desk. Those sorts of sh and there are hundreds of these shots in this film. It it's really like if you just gave Stanley Kubrick, you know, a camera and said, do some things invested in, you know, in space. And I think Stanley Kubrick got, I'd say a little bit carried away when he did this because as beautiful as those shots were, and I cannot, on the big screen, this would have been an experience like no other. But anyway, watching this on this screen here really has been an experience like no other. But that does lead me on to a very important point about this movie, and it's sort of one of the movie's problems. As beautiful and as creative as those shots were, there are so many of them in this film, and so many of them are so drawn out that it becomes a little bit of a chore to sit through them. 
that's why I was very like, wow, this movie's two and a half hours. There's got to be a lot of stuff to talk about. And surprisingly enough, there is stuff to talk about, but we'll get to that in a second because the things that really stand out are the ones where I, I suppose there wasn't really too much uh, of these grandiose shots of space and the universe. But, like, the, the first 16 minutes of this film were were just shots of earth and a and apes uh, were living as a society just almost completely brainless and docile getting into fights with each other having to fend themselves off from wildlife like uh well i think they were like water buffaloes i think and jaguars and wild zebras until one of them one of these apes, I'm going to call this Ape Dave for the sake of confusion, he stumbles upon a monolith that's just sort of like being embedded into the ground. And now he suddenly gets the idea to wield this this boat, this cut, this, this rib bone of a dead zebra, I reckon, just beats it on the ground. And all of a sudden, he's able to like virtually kind of stand and take take charge of the world. He's able to build a society in, in which now him and the rest of his of this sort of ape family are now able to feed for themselves and form some kind of orderly mob you might say i call this a mob because when he tries to like organize some kind of like meeting one unruly unsavory sort of ape just stumble, stumbles forward and then all of a sudden a dave ape basically beats him to death with uh, with this rib bone and then the others join in just to give him a few kicks here and there now what's quite now what, what, what everyone want to emphasize is that i think the whole point of the movie is that mankind's quest for knowledge which we have been hampering for since the very beginning of history if uh, the development of the apes is anything to go by is shown that ultimately we are dave because I reckon Dave is the person we follow most often in this film. He has attained perfect knowledge. He is all-powerful and all-compassing when we see him at the end of the film. Just sort of like this giant baby, just sort of like looking over the earth. But in terms of how we got to that point, we have to also uh, take you into an example of this story about this uh, of this uh, doctor called called uh, Fr uh, Frank uh, uh, Floyd. Uh, Dr. Floyd, who is sent to uh, a, a base on, uh, on on the on the surface of the moon because of very suspicious activity, and they I they didn't necessarily what the specific the specific sort of like mission was with uh, Frank going up to uh, the F Floyd going up to the moon, and well it eventually comes out that him and a team of other astronauts and scientists come across a second monolith on the surface of the moon. As soon as they touch it, it cuts to 18 months later where there's even more highly developed technology that is sending them all the way to, which sending them this team consisting of both, uh, oh God, I think of both Frank and Dave. And they it's, it's basically those two and HAL 9000 who are running the ship with three other, uh, four other crap, was it four like four uh four no it was definitely three other members of the crew who were in hibernation who how kills off within about the next 40 minutes because he determines that the fate of this mission mankind's ultimate quest for knowledge is far too beyond dave and frank's importance and it is ultimately how's mission to be perfect and to be as perfect as humans truly are even at the expense of his own crew this is how how's interesting because he is in many ways the development the next step in in evolution or revolution you might say because how is basically what the next form of life really will be artificial intelligence but not but he is not really technically artificial he is he acts like a normal person even though he's just a computer and his only means of of you know 
talking to people just through this this camera lodged into this into the computer all over the ship which is interesting I, I think that's really interesting the way they got around that by it would have just they could have just like made him a robot or just made him part of the ship but no he he really is they they try and emphasize that how is supposed to be technically a person but he is as flawed as everyone else because he has no barriers of consciousness no distinctions between right or wrong leading to him murdering most of the crew barring dave who after a very long uh, drawn out period where dave floats into uh, hal's memory bank and disables hal once and for all which basically leads us into the final part of the movie uh, beyond it was like beyond the inf beyond the infinite i think it was called where dave is within Jupiter's orbit and another monolith is floating in midair. Dave comes within, comes very close to it and all of a sudden he's sort of like, the cosmos is sort of rushing before him and he's, it's it's very weird how they did this because this one when this sequence went on for nearly 10 minutes of lights and basically like the Grand Canyon covered in ultraviolet light and like sort of like explosions happening on the camera from the universe to supernova I, I, like literally four million supernovas exploding all at once and it eventually comes to fruition where dave is in this strange room as an older man possibly a man of 50 who sees himself sitting at a table possibly a man of 60 just stumbling around and then it cuts to this older man who's basically lying on his deathbed and finally the, the I'm, I'm guessing the last monolith appears in front of dave and that's how he basically becomes this this bait this fetus because now he is all-knowing and all-powerful he did it ladies and gentlemen dave achieved ultimate enlightenment he is now the most powerful creature in the universe I think from from what I could judge and the reward for his quest has been that he now is looking over the earth and he has become God because our quest for knowledge has left us to become led us to this very moment and ironically Dave is almost nothing like a human or even a god at all he just looks precious in looking over the earth with these huge roll huge, in this huge baby with rolling eyes just looking down at the earth wondering what is it going to do now because we've come to a very that's a very strange way how this movie ends that it comes to the it arrives at the conclusion that we've done it we we can't go any further than this it's this is sort of the end of the road which that brings me to because basically what i just described was the whole movie Lot, very long shots of space uh, separate stories about uh, an eventual progress towards you know enlightenment and ultimate knowledge and the, the and, and then the credits roll with intermittent uh, Russian ballet and the famous dun, 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 dun. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, well, basically, yeah, that, well, basically, that happened, that occurs, and I know, if I, if it, it, I know as much as I said how fascinating this was to watch as an experience, but as a movie, I think I would have preferred something that was a little bit more, like, there isn't really much of a story, it's just a sequence of events, nearly 30 minutes each in length, some are a little bit dragged. That's the problem. Again, I have to emphasize is that you could have possibly cut a whole hour out of this movie and you wouldn't have really missed much. But what you would have missed were these beautiful sequences that, to be honest, and to Kubrick's credit, I don't particularly think that it would have been a good idea to have cut these out because... It's just a beautiful and and way of capturing space and capturing, well, not only demonstrating what could be done in 1969 with uh, these incredible 
ways to work in camera and special effects. But yeah, that's just it was a it was a dazzling spectacle to behold, and I could I could see how back in fifty two years ago people would have saw this as a bit you know a bit drawn out like. The lack of dialogue is... There's a sufficient... There's not really much in the way of dialogue in this movie. I reckon if you had, like... If I had, like, a script of the movie, in terms of dialogue, I think there would be about as much as maybe 35 pages of, of script, which is about, like, 35 minutes of dialogue at the very most in a two-and-a-half-hour movie. So you were talking about almost two hours of basically shots of space with occasional uh, Russian ballet music put in. Now, that's... In many which ways, I would say that's kind of where I wanted to end this video. But we're not quite done yet. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there was something about... Uh, with all these sequences of space, these uh, special effects, there was something very, very important I want to talk to you about. And I will resume that in just a quick moment. Hello again. Now, here's sort of what I wanted to touch upon in terms of summarizing 2001 A Space Odyssey, because I talk about how it's not particular, its story isn't its greatest strength. And in many ways, what I said about the quest for knowledge isn't necessarily its main strength either, because there is something even more important than this that really drew, caught my attention in this movie. I'll tell you exactly what that word is, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's, it's exactly that. It's not a word. It's not, it's not a thing. It's not an idea. It's a word. And that is creative. 2001 A Space Odyssey was very, very creative. They did things that almost no other film at this time ever really did. And by today's standards, that might not seem like much. Even possibly even when Star Wars came out, they probably did a few more creative things. The, the, the sets were maybe a little bit more elaborative and colorful and there was a more story involved there was more dialogue there was a there was things in star wars that even without ever seeing any of the movies i could tell you they did things very very differently to even in, even what what did i mean when did star wars like came out like nine years after i think it was like about eight or nine years after 2001 but what but the reason why I want to mention about how the creative camera angles and the effects they pulled off, that inspired me a little bit more than I think I can humanly comprehend. Because imagine the, the reception this must have received from people who absolutely loved this movie. I reckon they were the sort of people who were inspired by this movie to make movies of their own, exploring the cosmos and the universe of what could be done in this, what could be done in space, what can you shoot? Because you have to remember, the world in 1969 was, it was all about Sputnik, it was all about basically the race to land for the first man on the moon. It was all about, in theory, knowledge driving us farther into the universe than ever. Progress was the name of the game, in essence. So, with all, could you imagine what it must have been like that some people who got the idea of Stanley Kubrick capturing the, um, the public's imagination of, by the time either the Russians or the Americans get into space and get onto the moon, where will we be in 40 years from now, or... 50 years from now, where do we go from here? And I think that's fascinating because look at the world around you, ladies and gentlemen. L look at the things that were not around in this very room at this moment that we simply were not able to possibly conjure up in 1969. It was during either the 60s or the 70s where somebody said that 
one day we'll have a computer that can actually fit onto a desk. It was because of that where we have microphones that look like this, that capture sound beautifully. They have really complicated storage systems which look as if they could just fit into your back pocket, but they could hold nearly a lifetime's amount of information. We have we have these really uh we have these super compact and really really extensive, you know, easels with these beautiful wire meshing and just it's basically just two part two moving parts and you've got yourself something you could just draw for hours on. Uh, what else? I mean, we have these these fiber optic broadbands as well which are no bigger than let's say biscuit tins, but they could give us access to almost any channel in the world, anywhere you want to go, anything you want to experience. You want to maybe experience a different culture. You want to see how a, a certain type of food is made in another part of the world, possibly in a different continent, possibly from thousands of years ago. We have the knowledge. Everything in this room right now is a product of, that could not have been con conjured up in the year 1969. I mean, I have soundproofing pads, things that would be best in place in, in you know, high production studios. Apple Studios, Buddy Holly Studios, probably only just started to have the, the kind of information and the technology and the resources we possess right now. I mean, I mean seriously, just look at, look, at, look at everything we've had since that year. We've had, we've had comic books, we've had graphic novels, we have all sorts of means of expressionism. The, the box containing the, Sta the Stanley Kubrick uh, Warner Brother editions, even though I think uh, 2001 was made by MGM, I think. But just look at the films that, it, like the very next year, A Clockwork Orange and then The Shining, Full Metal Jacket, Eyes Wide Shut. And think about exactly the sort of things that Kubrick came up to capture the imagination. Think of what lengths he went to to make these films a reality. Whether or not you like these at all, and I mentioned before that I have seen A Clockwork Orange many times, and even though I do think the book is superior, it cannot be, it, you can, it cannot be denied how good this movie is. I mean, oh god, like, where else do we go? The, 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 the PlayStation 4 I have on my top shelf Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Video game consoles were just a mere fad, a novelty, if at all even possible, in the late 60s. But they were around. We also have cam camcorders, basically as, this, as big as this. We have separate micro microphones we could just slip on here with like, like, the, like the, just with a single touch. We have uh, desktop cameras which can capture images. We have giant giant sized uh, black and white film reels that are still being made by de made in development but the lenses are these are the sort of things you could only dream about in in days gone by we have and it's not just in technology where this really goes to because we have from books for example think about how books have evolved since that year we've had stuff like uh, paper, pencil, and you, which is basically just a whole series of just activities to stimulate the brain to work out just where, you've, where you could go in this world. Books that are made not just for reading, but for trying new things out, for gaining knowledge in very non-linear fashions. Who, what genius comes up with something like that and then, boom, the floodgates are opened. I mean, the short introduction series I've got on my shelf from Chaos Theory, Asperger's, Autism, Free Will, Game, uh, game Theory, uh, Chaos Theory, uh, Reality Theory, and Happiness. We are now scrounging the very, the very bottom to talk and discuss in lengths, in scientific ways, things that were merely the stuff of fiction, but we are bringing fiction into reality. We are discussing how a butterfly flapping its wings could lead to, in, in the Amazon, could lead to a pile of garbage appearing somewhere in Kentucky. Who would, who in their right mind think that was not just the, the words of a madman? 
I certainly don't, but people dedicate their whole lives to finding out stuff like this. It's their quest for knowledge to work out why principles and why ideas like that exist at all. I, I mean, oh god, what else? Where else do we go? Like, how about this uh, old version of the Highway Code? F remember, ladies and gentlemen, back in the late 60s, seatbelts were not mandatory. Now they're compulsory because we've proven that it saves lives. That's where else we're going, ladies and gentlemen. You know, screw COVID for one second. How many of us do you think we would still be here if all of a sudden we decided not to start wearing seatbelts anymore? It's, it's, it, think about that, ladies and gentlemen. That something very, very simple as that could have been the product of somebody deciding that it would be safer if we did. And it's how we've moved forward to to like driverless cars, to electric cars that are going to save the environment. And then we have, again, more sort of like modern stuff is that, is that pads that just, you draw on them and the image will appear on the screen. It means that paper will not become obsolete, but it means that less trees will be cut down for, the, for their sake. We're saving the environment by just one small step at a time. I mean, where, where do we go from here, ladies and gentlemen? Think about this. Or, if you even want to go even one further, digitized holographic images to save ink. Or, oh god, I don't know, what, what else can we do? Like, recyclable wallpaper, so you could, you could save a fortune in wallpaper or, so, or something like that, or... Where, where, else, where else can we go? Like, We'll be, we'll be saying that now uh, human feces will become renewable sources of energy due to the methane they produce. If we could do that, we could power this entire... We could, we could empower the enti almost the entire country of, the U of Ukraine with fuel for very nearly 10,000 years. I know that seems like hyperbole, but who's to say it isn't? Who's to say that one day we will not be on that, pr on the precipice of using it? The polar ice caps are melting as we know it, ladies and gentlemen. They're not going to come back anytime soon. So maybe we'll have no choice but to come down to a system where even exercise bikes, I know fine well they were still a thing, but they give us information about how far we've traveled and how much calories were burnt. That's the, the that sort of like advancement right there is a lifesaver because it actually tells us things about our body and how much we produce and how much we have left to burn and what we have to give and how much time we can do it. Time, ladies and gentlemen, is constantly working against us. From the moment we are born, the next logical destination is when we die. But what do we die for? I mean, chairs like these, again, you know, chairs with like wheels on them have not never necessarily gone away at, at any point. I think they like first came into like popularity like what was it like the fifties or something like that, but possibly before my dad was even born. But look at the look at the comfort on this chair, for example. Just lay back; it's nice and and also at the uh, the pull of a handle. Sit back and relax, and it's as though you're in a sauna or. You're in the pictures, or like one of those really expensive cinemas, where, and, and also this lovely little foo bar at the bottom as well. You just pull it out, fold uh, this part back, and you can. Your legs are just in vacancy, and all of a sudden, you could just be like this. Think of somebody decided to create a, a chair like this, and also at the touch of at the touch of a button. Well, with a pull of another lever, adjustable height. It's f it's practical. It's functional. It serves multiple purposes. You could just lie this thing out and just turn it into a bed if you wanted to. Watch. Uh, let's see. I think I, I think I have to like uh, a little bit more. Because I reckon if you just you just pop this up against the wall, 
put the foobar up like this and providing for some reason you're, stu you're, not, you're stupid enough not to afford a bed just buy one of these, these cost like about like 115 quid a pop and lie back and you could sleep easy tonight I mean you could like look at the stars almost and do this Although, I must admit, maybe they were designed for someone a little bit slimmer than myself, or possibly... Uh, let me try this again. Uh, steady myself, and... Uh, oh, that's... Absolute bliss and heaven, ladies and gentlemen. And as I sit here, just... You're probably also wondering where this is all going to, but you know what? I just noticed the light in there and even the likes of Thomas Edison must have been inspired at some point in their lives to decide that a light bulb is what we needed. And to pull this back out and uh, what's even better is, is that once you just saw like a uh, raises itself automatically and you, before you have it, f think about that, ladies and gentlemen, though. Think about what this film really does to... It does to creative and maverick directors to what the light bulb did to the world. It lit it up. It allowed us to see more clearly, probably, than ever before. This is the world, ladies and gentlemen. The world all around you is filled with wonderful, fantastic machines that would not even have been thought of possible from, like I said, to seat belts, to machines that are going to save the environment, to just shoes that are made to last, and gum that will take your mind numbingly away from the, uh, the thought of smoking. That sort of thing is going to save our lives as well, and... Uh, Think about electro ele electronic razors. That you know that saved the whole misery of shaving. Uh, goodness, goodness me! Uh, speakers and that you could just have in the showers, and also this, a smartphone, a phone that is probably smarter than us. That is more than just a phone, which came out in two thousand seven. One that plays music. One that allows us to talk to people face to face through cameras and other technologies aside allows us to play games like Candy Crush or Crossy Road allows us to make movies, allows us to reunite with people we haven't seen for years all of this is the world ladies and gentlemen uh, the world 52 years after 2001 A Space Odyssey 20 years after the year 2001 so, to end this video off on the only way I can possibly imagine, what is the world going to look like in 50 years from now, or 48 years from now for that matter, when 2001 A Space Odyssey will be 100 years old? Who's going to come along and change the game yet again? Who's going to make us turn on the light? Who's going to make us see the world that we have never quite seen it before. Though, as I've stated uh, time and time again, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm really, really keen on the keen on this expression as well. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, you see that? The bed. In my opinion, it's the single greatest human invention of all time. Because you could sit on it lie on it, make love on it, dream on it. It is there to allow us to sleep at peace. And you can't really put a price on that because everybody needs to sleep. But I think also everybody needs to dream. Think of that, ladies and gentlemen, because Time's getting on and I think it's it will soon be my turn.
to sleep again. And probably when I wake up, we'll see what the world becomes tomorrow. Take care, ladies and gentlemen, and goodbye for now.